developer relations in non-US markets. Justin engages with developers inside the major television broadcasters to help them in creating the best digital experience for Amazon's voice devices with Alexa built in. Do you, who has Alexa in your house? I have Alexa in my house. Awesome. Um, good. Additionally, he works with Amazon's devices and platform teams at Lab 126 in Sunnydale to help influence product roadmaps, both in hardware and software, with a, um, with a considerable depth of knowledge in voice enablement, which is going to be a big thing for disruption coming up is voice enablement, along with wearable and smart home technologies. He regularly speaks on these subjects at conferences and institutions around Europe. Please welcome Justin as he shares his thoughts on creating great customer experiences in a multimodal future. Welcome, Justin. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, so unlike Cami, I actually did touch the chocolate chip cookies, uh, trying to offset the jet lag here. So uh, hopefully no yawning during the presentation. So uh, hello again. Uh, I'm Justin Western, a solutions architect with Amazon based in London. Uh, today I'm going to be talking to you about creating multimodal experiences and what that means uh, to have voice and touch kind of intersect. So a little bit about me. Uh, I've been with Amazon about two years now. I moved from Houston over to London for this position. Uh, so I help developers basically voice enable their apps and also bring uh, in-app purchasing technolog technologies, uh, single sign-on implementation, basically anything with Alexa enablement. Uh, my team helps developers get on board with that. So as Cami mentioned, uh, I work a lot with uh, non-US markets. So I'm based in the, our headquarters in Shoreditch in London. So if any of you are familiar with the uh, geography, this is around Silicon Roundabout and Old Street in London. So we have a lot of tech companies there. Uh, and I spend a lot of time working with our teams in Seattle where we've been based for about 25 years now. Uh, mid 90s is when Jeff Bezos set up shop over there. Uh, and then a bit to the south in Sunnyvale Lab 126 uh, this is kind of our R&D lab. This is where uh, the people that designed the original Kindle back in the mid 2000s and uh, all our devices that have come since then to include the Echo devices, uh, they're based there. So we, uh, we partner with them very closely, especially from an international perspective to bring things to their attention that maybe they don't take into account because they're based in the US. And then a lot of my time is actually spent working with partner developers in Mumbai. Uh, so we each kind of take over a specific geography. We have uh, solutions architects that deal with the UK market, uh, with the German market, and my area of focus has been uh, the Indian marketplace, which is uh, proving to be one of our growth areas. Uh, we launched the Fire TV stick there in April of 2017 uh, and have seen a lot of growth since that time. So what is the Amazon App Store? Uh, most of you are probably familiar with other app stores that may live on your device, uh, your phone or your tablet. Uh, and the Amazon App Store is very similar to that. So all our Fire tablets, uh, Fire TV devices, uh, and the devices that you see on the screen here, Amazon App Store powers all of those experiences. Uh, so you can download this as kind of a secondary app store on any of your Android devices. It comes pre-installed on all, all Fire TV devices. Uh, it also lives on BlackBerry devices. Yes, that's still a thing. Um, and also all of our Echo devices. Uh, so any sort of transacting that you do uh, on an Echo device, Amazon App Store powers that behind the scenes. So I spend most of my time on the Fire TV devices. Um, increasingly, we're seeing voice forward experiences on these devices being uh, an area of focus for partner developers. These are the two ones that we have available in the UK right now. Uh, in the India marketplace, it's only the stick. Uh, in the US, you may know that we have another device that came out over the summer uh, that I'll be talking a little bit more about later, uh, which kind of incorporates voice in a more natural way. So in the Amazon devices um, team, we kind of have this notion of a flywheel. Uh, there's a very famous back of the napkin sketch that was made many years ago, uh, just with Amazon in particular, and we've kind of taken a derivative for that as far as it relates to devices. Uh, so let me walk you through this because there are kind of two parallel flywheels going in tandem. It all starts with content selection. So we work with partner developers to ensure that they bring their software to our devices. And by virtue of doing that, we create a better customer experience. So more customers want to buy said devices. 
And the more they use the devices and the software on those devices, then the more developers that we attract to build experiences for that. And so that increases selection. And then in parallel to this, we have this top circle going at the top to where the more software we have, the more scale we have, the lower the cost structure is. We can pass on those cost savings to customers and the customers engage more. And you can see these things keep going and going and going. Um, the idea is that the more that we focus on customers, the better the experience is going to be for everybody that's involved in the relationship. So I want to go back about 20, 25 years now uh, and talk to you about kind of how we got to where we are today when it comes to uh, digital relationships and interacting with software. So originally, uh, if you think back to the 1990s, you may have had an AOL account or some sort of uh, online ISP or local ISP. And the thinking would be you would probably go into your home office or the living room, you would sit down at a desktop computer, you would dial up and get that nice little modem sound going, and you'd spend maybe an hour or three hours online and then you would log off, right? So you would have a discrete session, uh, but that changed whenever uh, we ended up getting always connected mobile devices in our pocket, right? So it became less about having a website, which was the all important thing, to now having an application and an app icon that would live on that screen. That kind of came the storefront to your brand. Uh, and increasingly after uh, Facebook and Twitter and other social media platforms came into the mix, you also had to have a presence there. Um, obviously lots of folks have already spoken to you about that today. That's not my area of expertise, so I'll leave that to them. Um, but now people could engage with your brand at any time. And so you needed to think about what would be the best possible way to get them access to information, get them access to products, get them access to services. So if you were a customer of Amazon back in 1995, you may remember this website. Uh, I'm willing to wager that most of you were not at the time. Uh, we were just an online bookstore back then. Um, and this actually was taken, I believe, in August of 1995. Uh, it was very manual. Uh, it was hand curated by humans and not, not machines. Uh, and we would try to get you to uh, buy whatever our uh, I think the spotlight title was there at the top. And so we would actually, again, feature specific books and try to get you to buy it. Um, now, if you fast forward to today, this is a uh, screenshot of amazon.co.uk, uh, where I do all of my shopping now. Uh, and this is the Amazon App Store storefront on it. So obviously way, way more selection. Uh, it doesn't just span books, span software, services, all sorts of things. Uh, if you can think about it, odds are we will have it on amazon.co.uk. But odds are, this is probably how you interact with our brand today. It's a mobile app. Uh, most people do their shopping this way, uh, or at least that's how they curate what's in their shopping basket before they place that two-day prime order. So now, with your brand kind of always being available in someone's pocket, uh, people will just go and drop in and out of contact with it as they go about their day. Maybe they're cooking, maybe they're waiting in line at the doctor's office. Uh, you need to be present there, uh, and it's important to basically facilitate your product design to, uh, to optimize for that. So now that we have uh, phones in everybody's pockets, uh, developers started to explore what else they could do with it. Uh, and some of the things uh, that they started to tinker with in the mid uh, to late 20 teens uh, were experiences based on augmented reality or mixed reality. Some of you probably remember um, games of this sort. Uh, there was a very popular one a number of years ago that's still somewhat popular, Pokemon Go. Uh, this was perhaps most folks' first foray into augmented reality or mixed reality. Uh, so this encouraged you to get out of your living room, right? Go out into the real world and hopefully not walk into oncoming traffic like some people did or off a cliff. Um, but the idea was that no longer was software confined to just the screen. It was actually going out into the real world and there was a software overlay on top of that. Now, other brands started thinking about, well, if I can do that out in the world, what can I do inside the home? And so um, brands like Ikea and Home Depot and Lowe's started experimenting with virtual furniture that you could place in your living room to understand how that uh, ottoman would look before you actually brought it home from the store. Uh, and there is a, a small company you may have heard of in Cupertino uh, that had an event yesterday, um, and they have a new campus uh, that they built that opened last year. Uh, they have a visitor center that you can go to. It's free and open to the public, and they've got this really cool scale model of their uh, new spaceship office building, and they encourage you to pick up a tablet when you go in the, uh, the visitor center, and you can walk around at 360 degrees, and what you look at on the table, it's only just kind of a model, but when you look at it through the tablet, it comes to life, and so you can see people eating in the cafeteria or working working out in the fitness center, doing yoga, or going up down the hallways. And so it's a very lifelike experience. Uh, today it exists mostly in phones and tablets. Uh, I see that going into other devices as we go further into the future. 
Uh, so here's a shot of me with my daughter Elena playing Pokemon Go. She insisted when she saw this as we drove by. This was over in the Galleria area about two years ago. Uh, we had to get our photo by it. And so um, this was actually my other daughter who took the photo, which I'm kind of proud of. And uh, since we got Topo Chico out there in the uh, lobby, I'll give a shout out to my Topo Twins t-shirt that I'm wearing there. <laughs> Love that stuff. Can't get it in London, so I've already had five bottles here this morning. It's, it's amazing. Um, so that was one extension of what you could do with mobile. And another was uh, something via chatbots, engaging with brands via um, not a human on the other end of this kind of chat-based communication, uh, but a machine with the most uh, likely answers to questions that people would contact customer service about. Uh, this is very similar to IVR systems back in the 90s, interactive voice response. Um, the idea is that you can provide a lower friction way of contacting customer service from your phone in context when you need an answer. Uh, so I used this actually about a month ago whenever I was in London. Uh, the company that runs all the trains there is called TFL Transport for London. Uh, and I was changing from an underground train to an overground train. And I had no idea if I had to tap out at the little switchover thing before I changed. So before I left the platform, I texted them within their Facebook Messenger chat bot. Uh, and they told me, no, I didn't have to tap out at that particular station. I got my answer quickly, then had to go to Google and search it. It was a very uh, frictionless way of engaging. So we do this with the uh, Amazon Shopping app as well. Uh, we even pre-populate uh, likely responses or questions. Uh, the team that builds this is actually based in the UK, so we, I've had a chance to interact with them a bit and do some beta testing for them. It's really cool. Uh, it gets you answers quickly. If a package doesn't show up at your door, uh, go to this, and we can probably get you an answer very fast. So now I want to talk about video content. Uh, and a lot of the presentation today is going to be focused on this because it, it's kind of my focus area. Uh, so, you know, over the past five, 10 years, we've seen this new class of entertainment consumer called cord cutters or cord nevers. Uh, and these are people that never engage with traditional TV in the way that maybe you have in the past. So uh, they don't have a Comcast subscription or direct TV. Um, they're going kind of all OTT, over the top streaming services. And so this creates an opportunity for brands that own a lot of content to go directly to consumers and sell subscriptions to that content. Uh, there's been a lot of media coverage recently about Disney and their new service that they're going to be launching next year. They have a ton of IP. They, have, they know people will pay for it. So why not sell it directly to consumers, right? It makes a lot of sense. Uh, but this does change the landscape for advertisers in terms of how they get eyeballs back on their brands. Because if people are no longer expecting commercials uh, to be in this, on the service that they're paying 10 bucks a month for, uh, then where do you meet them at? Do you embed you know, advertising messages in the programming? Uh, I don't know, right? There are a lot of different ways you can go about it. Um, but it's not going away. So this is um, data from 2016 and 2017 uh, in the UK marketplace here. So this is a cons consortium of all the major British broadcasters uh, that make up BARB. Uh, and the, the key takeaway here is that all households or most households are going to at least having one SVOD subscription video subscription. Uh, in the US, it's even starker. <laughs> most households are going somewhere between two to four subscriptions that they pay for monthly. Um, so. Again, for content owners that have really good IP, uh, this is a tremendous opportunity for them. People are willing to pay for good content that they can get quickly and effortlessly. And so the sort of experience that you have on the weekend now is everyone's gathering around, not at a very specific time, but we're going to blow through an entire series, right? Or we're going to watch all the movies in this particular franchise because we have on-demand access to it. So. When you enter this new landscape where you know, advertising opportunities are changing, um, people's habits are changing, you need to th think creatively about how you get people to re-engage with your brand. Um, and one way that I've seen some mobile apps do this very effectively uh, is acknowledge that people are coming back to your service every single day. Call it out. You've engaged with a service 300 days in a row. I've got a screenshot here in a moment of one app that I think that does this really well. Um, and another thing that some of the trivia app designers are doing right now is to have a concept of appointment viewing in the same way that everyone huddled around the news or the TV to watch the news at 6 p.m., maybe 20 years ago. Uh, and so you're trying to get people all focused at, on one event at one time. Uh, and trivia is one way to do this and that a lot of people are uh, leveraging right now. And you really need to think about when you're going to best fit into somebody's schedule. Uh, don't try to shoehorn yourself into a part of their day where it doesn't make sense. Uh, the example I was mentioning is something called Time Hop. So this is an app that allows you to connect all your social media feeds to it. Uh, and then you can see what you were doing one year, two years, 15 years ago, depending on how long you've been on social media. Uh, and then they tell you at the end of interacting with the app that day how many days in a row you've come back to it. Uh, so I took this one a few days ago, 613 days in a row. I'm very proud. Um, and I even got 
a little ribbon at the bottom, right? And so it doesn't take much developmental effort, um, but it does reinforce this thing of coming back to it daily. So now every morning, whether I'm in London or Seattle or Houston, whenever I have my coffee, I open time hop. It's just kind of trained into me, right? And so with trivia apps specifically, um, some of you may have heard of HQ Trivia. Uh, they, they've gotten a lot of traction recently. I think they do this really, really well uh, to where they'll send you not a ton of push notifications, but maybe a few minutes before the trivia game's about to start. Uh, you get you know, hundreds of thousand people globally that are playing this game simultaneously. You get to split a cash pot. Uh, I heard they're doing like a 100,000 pot here coming soon uh, for the Target sponsoring. Um, so they do this really well. Uh, Samantha B, the uh, late night commentator, just launched another app uh, called This Is Not A Game, The Game, that's basically incentivizing people uh, to get involved with politics that takes a very similar model. Uh, appointment viewing, getting together at the same time, asking questions, winning money. Uh, so clearly this, this model is working. So now let's talk about kind of the current day reality of brands and their relationship with software. So when people think about voice, uh, as Cami mentioned, a lot of people think about the Echo devices, uh, Alexa. Uh, we're certainly not the only game in town. I, I may be partial uh, to our game, but uh, when people think about voice interactions, there's a reason why they're doing it. Uh, and hopefully this shows up okay. Yeah, not too washed out. Um, so why do people use voice interactions? Uh, well, it's kind of what you would assume. It's convenient, it's, it's faster than typing, it's uh, easy to use, it's fun. Uh, maybe they're early adopters. Some of this uh, will, the shininess will wear off over time. You can't just kind of create a new uh, way of interacting with content and think you can always have the, um, the novelty factor to drive that. But if, as long as it actually brings real consumer, consumer benefit, uh, real value to them, then people will continue to engage with it. Now, when you think about possibly adding voice to your software, your app, uh, your brand experience, there are some kind of tenants that you need to take into account. So start with the desired result and work backwards. Um, I don't mean that to sound overly fluffy. What I mean by that is why would you add voice in this particular feature or, or in this particular area? Uh, do I want someone to accomplish something, f accomplish something faster? Uh, would it be needlessly involved uh, and take a lot of time uh, if I didn't do this via voice? And so look for steps, think about what people are doing to get to a desired result and how do they accomplish that today, either via touch or via some sort of remote control. And if there's a way to do that faster via voice, then kind of double down on that. Um, and one thing I will say, don't just add voice to seem cool, okay? Don't just add voice for voice sake. So uh, an example of doing voice well in the voice or the Amazon shopping app here, you can say, Alexa, add shampoo to my basket. That's faster than typing shampoo on my keyboard, right? Uh, and odds are, if I've ordered shampoo in the past, they know exactly the brand and the quantity and the volume that I want, and it'll go directly into my shopping cart. An example of somewhere this doesn't make sense is some sort of word jumble game where I say, Alexa, move the letter in to B5, no, A7, oh gosh, let me just hold down on the N and slide it up to the, the square where I want it, right? In that context, touch makes a lot more sense than voice. We could do it with voice, it just doesn't make sense to. And so now I want to talk about what that means uh, from a TV perspective. So engaging with video content via voice. And we have a framework for this uh, called Video Skills Kit, or VSK. Uh, and this, uh, honestly, is what I've been going around the world talking to developers about the better part of 2018. Uh, in essence, it's a way to get people to the content they already know and love quickly uh, via very little effort. Uh, and that's what is important to content owners. They want people to stay engaged with their brand, with their particular app, with their video content. Uh, they don't want them to leave that experience and go to a competitor. And so the easier you make that for consumers to get to their desired end game, whether that's a live channel or a particular video, a film, whatever, um, that, that is a net win for um, partner developers. And so our first foray into this uh, was something we called uh, F3 TV, Far Field Fire TV. Um, near field is when you hold down a remote controller and say something into a microphone. We call that near field. Far field is talking to an echo device like this or some sort of speaker. Um, so we have a lot of these echo devices already in the marketplace. Uh, we already have a lot of these Fire TV sticks in the marketplace. And so we provided an easy way for people to connect the two of them and be able to talk to the echo and have something happen on their Fire TV, on their TV device. 
And so what sort of things could happen? Um, well, they're the ones that are on the screen. You can launch apps. You can say, uh, Alexa, open HBO Go. Or you can say, Alexa, watch Game of Thrones. Uh, you can browse and search this way. Uh, it, it's very, very quick and easy to do. And I've got some examples here in a moment that'll show it. Um, and the data that we see here in the US, uh, the most used feature of this VSK framework is the implicit launch, or what we call quick play. And you can kind of understand why, right? Uh, if I walk into my flat at the end of the day, and I've had a long day, and I always say, I just want to watch some daily show, I can say, Alexa, watch the daily show. And I didn't have to think about what app it's on. I don't have to think about which episode I last watched. The app already knows that because they've implemented this framework. So it's very quick for me to get to the content that I want. Um, additionally, this allows for live channel changing. So I can say, tune to BBC News or tune to CNN, depending on which geography I'm in. And I can also control playback. I can say, Alexa, pause, Alexa, fast forward. Um, again, we, we find that customers are using that an awful lot. And so why, why do this? Why um, kind of put to the side the remote that everyone has used for the better part of 50 years? Um, well, we think that, again, speed, speed to content is important. Uh, we see people really adopting this, and people do want that. Uh, they want to talk to their devices as a human and not have to worry about specific syntax and specific phrases, right? We want to simplify this, make it very natural language oriented. Uh, and we launched this in the US. Um, the actual far field fire TV we rolled out in November of last year. Uh, we kind of went all in on this over the summer uh, with a big rollout. You may have seen some of the commercials for this. Uh, the Can Your TV Do That initiative. Uh, we are only increasing kind of that push to show that voice forward is best. So the first time you ever set this up within the Alexa app, you just have to do this once. You kind of go in there, tap Fire TV, tap the device that you want there. Uh, and I've got two pairings set up. I've got one in my flat that I have with a, an Echo that sits on my kitchen counter. And then I travel with one too. I travel with a, a tap and a TV stick. So whenever I go into my hotel or my Airbnb, this is one of the first things I do. Uh, connect to Wi-Fi and make sure I've got my voice control devices enabled. Um, so let's take a quick look at what this is like in action. And these guys have assured me the audio is going to work. Alexa, fast forward two minutes. Audio's not working. Alexa, rewind 30 seconds. Alexa. Pause. Yeah, I think once you go on HDMI, it <coughs> Alexa. doesn't allow that. Next episode. So what you're seeing on the screen uh, as we go to plan B, um, basically I can say, Alexa, go to the next episode. And that's what you're seeing here. Basically for any uh, series-based uh, video content, you can either uh, go to the next episode. I can say, go back to the beginning. I'll rewind specifically to uh, the first part of it. Um, and then I can say, Alexa, pause if I want to go to the restroom or something. Um, again, it, it's very fast to respond, which I think is a very important piece. Um, and customers tend to like it. So this was the other device that's not available uh, in the UK yet, unfortunately. Uh, but we have rolled it out here, I think, back in June. Uh, so this is the Fire TV Cube. Uh, basically, it combines the uh, far field nature of a Echo uh, into a Fire TV device. Um, and it provides all that VSK functionality that I mentioned to you out of the box uh, for any of the developers and developers that have embedded it. And so uh, I want to go through a, a demo here to show you kind of what it's like to accomplish the same task using a remote control as we have historically done uh, versus doing it via voice. And so our task, should we choose to accept it, um, is going to get to a very specific scene in the film Trouble with the Curve that is uh, showing on Netflix right now where Clint Eastwood is making a decidedly Clint Eastwood face. Uh, and I want to show it to you here. So uh, the first one here, again, we're going to try to get to 30 minutes into the film Trouble with the Curve. Uh, and we're going to start at the Fire TV home screen. So the first thing I need to do is I need to click on the Netflix app icon. And that'll get me to the profiles page. So I'm Justin, so I'm going to click on Justin. And then I'm to the Netflix homepage. So I need to go over to the little magnifying glass there on the top left and click on that. And I'm going to start typing in trouble using my up, down, left, right, scrolling on my remote control. And after I get to the E, you can see Justin Timberlake has pre-populated there as the top result. So I'm going to click on that tile. And then I'm to the content detail page. And so let me click on play. All right, now we're to the Warner Brothers screen. But now I need to fast forward 30 minutes in, right? So I'm going to start scrolling about 10 minutes in. 
Ah, and there's that face we've been looking for, right? Doesn't it just scream, get off my lawn? Yeah, that's, um, that's Clint Eastwood. Okay, so um, I'm not going to tell you how long that took yet, and obviously I've sped it up for the purposes of this demo, but we did do this in real time in our lab in London, so I have actual uh, time on how long it took. So now let's take option number two. We're going to accomplish the same thing using voice. Uh, so I'm going to say, Alexa, uh, play this film, uh, and then Alexa, fast forward 30 minutes. So back to the home screen, I'm going to say, Alexa, play Trouble with the Curve on Netflix. And then straight away, we're playing. And then I say again, Alexa, fast forward 30 minutes. And then there's that face, right? You're going to think about that face when you leave here today. That's, uh, that's fantastic. <laughs> and to be fair, Amy Adams and the other gentlemen in front of them also have fantastic expressions of this particular scene. Um, but that's neither here nor there. So um, the scorecard. With touch, uh, it would have taken approximately 70 seconds, uh, 38 remote clicks, which is a lot, right? Because I'm going up, down, left, right to type in trouble with an on-screen keyboard, which is not great, if we're being honest. Uh, via voice, it took 24 seconds, two utterances, um, much faster, right? Got us to that Clint Eastwood mug. So why use VSK? Why have we uh, been kind of spreading the gospel around the globe about this? Uh, well, the example I just showed you here is with Fire TV. Um, we have a broader vision than that, and we built the, uh, the framework uh, to accommodate other streaming media players. Uh, we understand that not every home has a streaming media player, so we also talk with hardware manufacturers, cable and satellite box manufacturers, to where this same sort of functionality can be built into smart TVs. Uh, basically, anywhere that you can consume video content, we want to be able to provide a framework to get to that content via voice. Um, again, kind of hammering on this creation of habits, creation of engagement. Uh, the more people use this, the more likely they're continuing to use it. So we want to ensure that people build it into their daily routine. Um, and one thing I didn't show here, which I think is kind of cool though, um, we have the ability to both implicitly and explicitly target specific devices and content. So what I mean by that, uh, I could say, Alexa, watch Game of Thrones on the upstairs TV. Uh, and then instead of, even if I'm in my living room when I say that, it would start playback on the corresponding uh, device with that content, presuming I'm entitled to it. So uh, pretty cool, that's VSK. Now, moving on from TV to something else um, that we uh, are seeing emerge, uh, we, we being Amazon have a version of this device, but other hardware manufacturers have it too. Uh, there's something we call multimodal devices. Uh, and these are kind of appliance-like devices uh, that live in your home uh, that treat both hard or touch and voice as equal class citizens. And so we really see a lot of people putting these in their kitchens or bedrooms. Uh, the way that we've positioned it, and I think we're even marketing it this way, is it's kind of like that TV that's always lived in your kitchen that you know and love, uh, but it's much smarter and it can do a lot more things. Uh, and so I'm talking about, at least in our case, um, the Amazon Echo Show. Um, like I said, other smart display devices are on the market right now, but they all kind of take a similar approach uh, to what it means to live uh, in a post-touch future. Uh, and by that, I mean, here's an example of me searching for movie show times. Uh, so I can say, uh, Alexa, scroll right. I can say, Alexa, select the sixth one here. I, I don't have to touch it if I don't want to. And odds are, if I'm in the kitchen and I'm making dinner, may have like olive oil on my hands or something, I'm really not going to want to touch the device and get it all oily, right? So uh, we treat uh, all kind of input here very equal. Now, the the challenge here is, for brands specifically, is there are no apps that live on these, by and large. Um, there, it's a combination of skills and templates, um, but it's a very different paradigm from what everyone has spent the last 10 to 15 years kind of refining when it comes to building an app uh, and kind of moving on to whatever came after websites. So uh, what can you do to maintain that brand prominence in a multimodal um, environment? So we encourage partners uh, to double down the things that people already associate with their brand. We still allow you to put things like logos and splash screens, right, to where you get that brand front and center straight away. Um, or if you have a jingle, right, if you're NVC and you've got that nice little xylophone thing they do, uh, maybe every time they start to engage with a skill or a, um, um, a particular uh, video content on that device, you show that first, right, before you go directly into playback. So since customers have expectations for how your brand should look or, sh look or sound, like actually lean into that, right? Show people, play that jingle, show that logo straight away. Um, and one thing that I found very interesting is that if you say the name as part of the utterance, if you say, Alexa, ask Uber to call me a car, or Alexa, ask BBC News to give me my flash briefing, um, the retention of, and that brand association really increases. And so there's a, 
a study done in London, uh, it was about on 100 folks here, where we asked people to wear, not we, this was a third party to be clear, not Amazon. Um, they were asked, study participants were asked to wear uh, kind of a headset, and this would uh, measure brain activity as people would carry out different tasks. They were asked to do type in inquiries where the brand name was included, and then they were asked to also state the name out loud when they did that. And you can see the, uh, the engagement level, the activation of brain activity there is actually much higher when you speak the name. Um, this kind of makes sense if you think about it in the same way as you introduce yourself when you meet someone new, right? You say, hello, my name is Justin, right? Nice to meet you. It reinforces that name. It gives them another opportunity to make that imprint in their mind as to who you are. Uh, and in the who in a brand's context is obviously their brand name. So that's multimodal. We'll talk a little bit more about it in a bit. Uh, but I also want to talk about two other areas where we see voice being particularly important. Uh, one of them is in an automobile context. Um, and so before I even dive into this, let me uh, say a couple things up front. Uh, it's important to not be distracted when you drive. Uh, we think that it's uh, using voice as a way to mitigate that risk to some degree. Uh, and as you have probably done in your own automobile in the past, let's say you wanted to hear a particular album or artist. Um, in the past, you may have like tapped on a little magnifying glass and start typing in something, uh, the artist name or album name. Hopefully you're at a stoplight when you're doing this. Um, and then you would actually get the result and hit play and then you're jamming out, right? Um, a better way to do this would just be do it via voice. Um, so Alexa, play the Beatles, and then you get directly into Here Comes the Sun. Uh, again, it's trying to keep your attention on the road and, and away from your device. Um, other, I think, hardware manufacturers are doing this really well uh, to minimize the distracted driving sort of um, risk. Uh, but anywhere that you can be voice forward in an automobile is better, certainly better than looking at the screen. So another environment where we see uh, voice getting increasing um, interest is in hospitality settings. So uh, whether this is a hotel uh, or an Airbnb sort of construct or a home away, uh, as Cammie was mentioning to me earlier, she uh, enjoys staying at. Um, the, the idea is that the sort of thing that you would have normally called the front desk for in the past, whether it's to get room service or uh, send up some additional towels because they forgot to put some in last night, uh, you can do all this via voice with an, uh, an Alexa device within the room. Um, and so beyond just having some baseline things you could do, you could also allow people to connect their own accounts to it to where they would have access to their own audiobooks or their favorite music. Uh, or if they've done uh, Alexa comms voice communication, they could call someone directly from this in hotel room device. Uh, and brands are certainly uh, empowered and provided the tools to where they can create their own experiences here. Uh, and as it relates to kind of Airbnb hosts, uh, which are not, you know, giant corporate entities, uh, we provide a, a service called Alexa Blueprints that allow you to create kind of your own interaction. Uh, it doesn't require any development experience. It's very WYSIWYG. What you see is what you get. You log on to the Alexa developer portal. And we have some templates, and one of them is kind of like a house guest guidebook. Uh, so you can say things, if you were to set this up, you could say, Alexa, what's the Wi-Fi password? Which, again, being a geek, this is one of the first things I set up when I walk into an Airbnb. Uh, or I could say, Alexa, where's the newest, nearest tube stop? Uh, if I'm uh, trying to look for public transit options. So uh, I would definitely encourage you to poke around with this. It's not just um, to create hospitality settings. You can also do kind of trivia games with it. It's actually really neat. Uh, it's a really neat thing. So as, as it relates to hospitality, though, uh, these are some of the use cases uh, that you'll be able to accomplish uh, if you go to a hotel that has one of these Alexa devices in it. So getting room service, asking for an additional toothbrush, um, this sort of thing. Again, we're trying to remove friction from how you accomplish a task. So looking forward, um, I've talked about you know, having voice in a television uh, experience, but there are going to be other devices that we see become voice enabled. And so I think it's good to have a framework on how humans interact with these different devices. So when you think about a human modality uh, and how it relates to a device's mode, I wanna step you through kind of at least my worldview of how this all interconnects. So me as a human, I sense something, I have a desire, I want something to happen. And I need to make sense of that. So I process that, I analyze it, and ultimately I make a decision to act. And my device needs to meet me where I'm at at that time where I want to act. And so the device mode here, you'll see it's constantly monitoring in the case of whether it's a touch input or a voice input, it needs to meet me at the time of intent, at the time I act. And then it needs to parse that utterance if it's a voice sort of command uh, and translate that into an actual action that it will take. So it will respond and control and then this loop kind of continues going around in a circle. Again, this applies not just to voice interactions but also to touch interactions. 
So again, as we combine these two experiences, what is it important to remember? Um, people will naturally need some, some guidance along the way. So it's important to be able to provide them little tips, whether that's on screen uh, or whether it's via voice, if they're having a voice only experience. And know that not everyone is going to interact the same way. I may be very comfortable having a voice sort of interaction with my software, uh, but my mom may not. Maybe she wants to continue to use a mouse and keyboard to interact with it or a tap sort of environment if she's on her tablet device. So meet customers where they're at. And so here's a couple of examples of showing how you can onboard people to voice experiences if they uh, are maybe not familiar with them. So uh, here's a customer. She's looking to download a new game on her TV device. She could either pick up the remote and click the download button there where it says uh, get for free, or you'll notice at the very top there's a tip saying, why don't you try, say, Alexa, download this app? and it would accomplish the same thing. So she may not know that she could just say that, right? So we have to onboard her in a way uh, to where she can learn that these functions are available. Or if a new app adds VSK like Hulu did over the summer, uh, the first time they launch it after the app was updated, we have some example phrases of what they can do, uh, how they can interact with this device uh, and this particular software. So. One other thing that's important, uh, since we have these various modalities to take into account, is what happens when a customer moves between them? What does that look like? And what does that mean in terms of development effort required? So you're going to need to de uh, design experiences where they can move from maybe a voice to a touch experience and, and go back and forth. Uh, you need to understand that this really will mean developing multiple entry points and ways to catch them. You don't want to send them down a one-way street or make them go through a one-way door to where they have no way of going back and continuing with only voice or only touch. And so let's say, um, again, these are the most popular uh, voice devices that we have right now, just the traditional Echoes. Um, but let's say I've got a skill that I've created for this as a developer. Uh, but then a customer buys something like this, where it's a dock that means that they can go between a tablet mode, which is an app, right, traditionally, or a skill mode where it's voice forward. I need to be able to catch them no matter which context they're in. So let's take, for example, NPR. Um, NPR has a flash briefing. Uh, some of you are probably familiar with flash briefings. I can say, Alexa, give me my flash briefing, and she'll go directly into playing whatever the news of the day is. Um, and so I'm staying only in voice here, but let's Got the flash briefing there. But let's say uh, I'm in the all recipes skill and I've asked to uh, make avocado toast because I'm a millennial and what else would I eat, right? Just only <laughs> avocado toast. Um, and so I make my avocado toast and I'm going to eat it. Uh, but then I realize, man, this is a really good recipe. I want to save this for uh, making later and maybe I'll research some other avocado recipes. So I would pick this tablet up off its dock and then I'm back in tablet mode and I need a way to catch the customer there. So the all recipes skill will hand that off to the app and then I can save that as my favorites within the All Recipes app. So again, that does mean creating two different entry points, two different experiences. It does mean double the development effort potentially, um, but customers have this expectation for how they can move between the experiences seamlessly. And so when you link all this together, uh, and hopefully the audio may work a little better this time, I got one more video here that shows kind of linking all these experiences together to create uh, kind of a sequence of events. With Fire TV Cube, you can set Alexa routines to save you time. Routines allow you to string together a series of actions that kick off with a simple Alexa utterance, like, good morning, or I'm home. Use the Alexa companion app on your phone to set them up. Go to menu, routines. We've set up a routine and called it good morning. When invoked, Alexa will turn on the lights, raise the blinds, and turn on the TV and show my flash briefing. Now, you can simply say the name of your routine, Alexa, good morning, and this happens. The name of the newest royal baby has been revealed, the Duke and Duchess of Cambridge, naming their third child, Louis Arthur Charles. So kind of the key takeaway here is stringing multiple of those events together, right? Things that normally in the past may have taken multiple utterances or multiple taps, uh, but you can automate that and link it all to a particular wake word. Say, Alexa, good morning, and then all this cool stuff happens, right? The blinds raise, um, the TV turns on, I, maybe the coffee pot initiates, um, all from one word. Um, so again, it's all about convenience for customers here. Uh, and really, again, it's about meeting the customers where they're at as they go through their daily lives. Um, for, for Amazon, it's really important, especially kind of the home as that main base. We want to make sure that we uh, enable customers to have the best possible experience in that particular environment. So uh, a couple of final thoughts here as it relates to what it means to uh, create um, this relationship with customers. Um, I think it's 
it may be obvious to state um, that brands have opinions and positions. And I, I don't just mean like Nike, like we heard about earlier and uh, maybe taking a position with Colin Kaepernick, but also as you create an experience, like if you were to ask Alexa right now, what's your favorite pizza topping or what's your favorite college football team? She actually has opinions on this. I and mean, this isn't stuff that we uh, just programmed into her. This isn't human curation. Uh, we've used machine learning to allow her to consume a giant data set and then make her own judgments and opinions and associations between things. And so we think it's important that she seems more human uh, because the more human she seems, the more likely you are to continue to interact with her. Um, I think about as a, I was an army brat growing up uh, and I moved around every two to three years. I, one of the brands that I have just this tremendous relationship with even still today is Nintendo, right? Because no matter where I went, I could pack up and unpack my Nintendo entertainment system and fire it up and there was Mario and there was Link, right? And so um, I created that brand association very early on. And I think it's important that brands who have this, you know, tremendous intellectual property and they have these great experiences to share with customers, uh, that they really lean into those, right? So create that emotional connection, create the uh, leverage of the intimacy that it brings, right? Whether it's someone uh, very early on in their developmental phase to where they're building brand associations like I did with Nintendo or someone later in life that are just getting exposed to your brand in the first time. So we talked about Pokemon Go as it relates to augmented reality and mixed reality. Um, I, see, I see this really being uh, an area of tremendous focus for a lot of technology companies over the next five to 10 years. I think we're gonna see a lot of movement uh, in this space. Uh, and it's not just gonna be um, the things that we've seen kind of gimmicky with games as uh, we have today. Uh, it's gonna be increasingly using voice to interact with that, using gestures, actually moving around in 3D space and you know pointing a device or wearing a device that will perceive something. Uh, and it's not just gonna be about layering information on top like RoboCop or Terminator 2, right? It's also gonna be about extracting information out of that environment. Um, one of the first things that we've done within the shopping app is uh, the ability to look at a particular object, like a screw here, um, look at it and uh, basically pattern match it against a coin, a penny in this case, so we know the scale, uh, and then be able to find that particular part, right? So maybe it's a nut or a bolt or a light bulb or something, right? Being able to use the, the camera on your device to analyze that, uh, that's an example of augmented reality or mixed reality uh, to where we can kind of combine both the digital and physical. Also, um, I talked about getting people comfortable with voice interactions and making it seem more human. Um, one thing that I struggle with, because I, obviously I've kind of gone all in on this voice thing, right? Beyond just kind of being professionally employed by it, I use it in my daily life an awful lot. Um, and I was in the elevator uh, last weekend taking some recycles to the bin store in my, my flat, and I said out loud, Alexa, what's the Nebraska score? not thinking to myself that uh, there was no Alexa around me. I was in an elevator with no internet connection, but it just seemed so natural to me that I, I would get that piece of information by virtue of voice. Um, and because now I do view that as a reliable, trustworthy kind of companion relationship or a, a, a vetted source of information, like that trust has been built with me. And so I, I really lean into that. Um, but over time, the likelihood that I'm going to be in a situation where I won't have access to that voice sort of interaction is decreasing. Uh, increasingly, we have third party devices that are embedding the support in it, whether it's a, a thermostat or a phone or earbuds or a Sono speaker or a Bluetooth speaker that you take out with you to the beach. Um, Again, we want the, the voice interaction to kind of just be second nature to you, to where you, whenever you want information, you can get to it quickly. Uh, so I'll kind of wrap with this um, because I've talked a lot about voice and touch and the relationship between the two. Uh, it's always important to know what's best for each occasion. Okay, so let's say I'm walking into the bedroom at the end of the night and I have my partner there and there's a light on and I could say, Alexa, turn off Mrs. Lamp, but that would probably result in a very unhappy partner, right? Who's already fallen asleep. So a better solution would be to open up an app and say, turn off the lamp, right? Just tap on the button there. Or if we're decidedly old school, if there's a button on the lamp, I suppose I could walk over and touch it, right? But I mean, <laughs> that's just ridiculous, admittedly. So um, again, whether you're at the beach, um, whether you're in an elevator shaft, hopefully eventually, if you wanna have a voice conversation with uh, a, an entity such as Alexa to get information, you'll be, you'll be able to. So in summary, um, to kind of bring this all full circle, um, know that not everyone's gonna be going on this voice experience from the same starting point. Uh, you need to help people uh, along the way. You need to be able to allow them to transition uh, between modalities and give them hints that aren't intrusive. 
Um, let them steer the way they want to steer. Uh, don't force them down a cliff or force them off a cliff. Again, always allow them to use touch if they want to, but if they want to use voice, have that available as well. Um, this routine thing that I talked about, the streaks and time hop, I, I think this is increasingly important, especially as people's attention is fragmented across a whole variety of experiences. Anything you can do to kind of get your brand prominence back up to the top of someone's mind is probably time well spent. Just don't be spammy about it. Um, again, honor the modality that customer is in. If they've been interacting via touch for the majority of a particular session, let them continue via touch. Don't try to force voice down their throat. Um, and finally, recognize that brand prominence in this new kind of multimodal future does mean different things. Uh, in the past, maybe something worked on a website or maybe it worked in an app. That doesn't mean it's naturally going to translate to a voice experience. So listen to your customers as you start experimenting with this, which I encourage you to do. Guide them or let them guide you based on the feedback. If they think that something is too intrusive, if they don't like the way in which you have jingles at both the beginning and end of a session, then you know listen to that feedback uh, and iterate accordingly. So with that, uh, I will wrap. Thank you everyone uh, for staying awake after lunch. I uh, hope you got something out of this today. And uh, Cami, I guess I'll turn it back to you. Thank you. Thank you very much.